My name is Lance Conrad, and I'm an author. I write books for a living. I went from crawling to sprinting. Now I could run through not just one world, but many. But not just one life, but hundreds. He wants to marry her. He'll have to come to Tetuan. How about a nice spoiled cousin who bullies him all the time, right? What if these two characters fell in love? What if these two characters fought to the death? Show me him standing up against an entire army single-handed and throw most of the race before hopping out to run the last. That's a little bit different. True story, by the way. Somebody went on a trip or somebody came to the town. There's your plot. They took that big old forehead and just crashed every brick board and brother in the house. Let me tell you a story. Welcome, everyone. Uh, as anyone who's been paying attention has noticed, uh, we've been doing live streams for a few weeks now, and we've had a few different formats. We've had Story Stream, where it's me and Mike Forsyth, the other writer for Word of the Day, and we're just telling stories from history. And then we've had Ask Lance, where it's just me mostly talking about books and writing and stuff like that. But there is one more uh, theme that we're going to do, and so the name of this one is tell me a story and for this we bring in someone else uh and we we kind of draw the stories out of them because i love stories okay this is like my soul uh and so uh, i just get to do this right i have such a cool life uh, on. yes <laughs> yes uh if it turns out he doesn't have any cool stories, I will begin lying on his behalf. Right? Okay, we'll just that sounds good. We'll, we'll we'll keep that there. Anyways, we'll make the show interesting for everybody. One right? way or the other, <laughs> dang it. Uh, anyway, I am joined today uh, by William Thorpe. Uh, will, great to have you here. Yeah, great to be here. Uh, and so to kind of tie in how how you came to be here, among other reasons. You were the cover designer for one of my book designs. Yeah. So, uh, pr price of yes, the price of survival. survival. Do we have That's that uh, that graphic? Nope. Can we put nope. that up. We, we got right. the book here, though. Yes, we we do have the book. Oh, there we go. There we go. Probably can hear me better now. All right. So the the price of survival, and we'll work on maybe getting a a better graphic on there. Uh, but this is one of my favorites, partially because it has one of my favorite characters on there, Chuck. Uh, those of a, those have who have read that book know who I'm talking about. Um, now, Will, when you were approached with this project, what, what were you thinking about? First of all, I, I have to ask, sorry. What did you think when I told you that I wanted a plant on the front cover? It was surprising. It felt really boring, especially <laughs> after seeing your first few books. It's like you want a plant. Like we have fire and stone on the other ones, and but this one you just want a plant. And, and once you talked about it some more, it, it kind of it made more sense. But it, it does make sense in the end. Um, but uh, no. I don't know how much you want to spoil with that. But it's a talking plant, right? Oh, quote unquote talking. Y you know what? We we can. Uh... Let, let's just go ahead and do a small reading. Yeah. As far as spoilers, this happens within the first page. Okay. So, so we don't need to go <laughs> go very far. Uh, at least it's starting to warm up a, li a little, Kip commented. The sun is out longer and longer each day. Yes, I nodded sagely, as if I really had some sense of this planet's seasons. Kip seemed to enjoy it when I acted old and wise, though I spent most of my time asking questions like a curious child. Spring is right around the corner. I feel it too, said Chuck the talking plant. He often chimed in to agree with me. Of course, we plants always know about that stuff. Now, I feel it's my duty here to clarify something about this situation. Chuck is not actually a talking plant. There's no such thing. Chuck is a regular plant. Kip is insane. <laughs> uh, so that is the story of Chuck the talking plant. Uh, he's not really... A yeah. talking plant. It's but, all in the guy's head, You know, right? the, the guy <laughs> talks to the plant, and the plant talks back, and he tells other people what the plant said. And I've always said that I base a lot of my my stories off of real-life experiences. Right, what you know, right? Exactly yeah. so. So. So, where I got Chuck the talking plant is I had a plant named Chuck that I would talk to. Uh <laughs> 
So you're the crazy guy. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes you don't have to go very far to, to find the crazy. Uh, but yeah, I would. Uh, and there was a reason why I wanted Chuck to be the symbol of survival. Because he would travel with me. Okay, I'd put him in the passenger seat in my car when I go on, uh, you know, book tour trips, and I would buckle him in, right? And we would go, and I, I would talk to Chuck. Uh, and then one day I was down at my parents, uh, helping out with some ranch stuff. I brought Chuck with me, and I had him sit outside the car to, you know, get some sun and whatnot. And some cows came by and ate him, uh, like right down to the roots. And then I took it back to, Lance, to my mom. Lance, it's time for me to go. <laughs> I found somebody else. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, Chuck was then eaten by cows. And then we took him back to my mom's to see if there was anything we could do because she's a you know plant guru, uh, ultimate green thumb. Um, and we left him outside, and the wind came and just blew, blew it across the, the yard. And so we go and find this this dried-out, tattered root that once was Chuck and sticking back in some dirt, he was fine. No, Bounce huh? back, no problem. And that is why Chuck is is the ongoing symbol of survival, <laughs> is you just can't kill him can't with kill. frost or fire or cows. Uh, but well, anyways. I, I would say the cover was probably in Dire Straits when I found it. Yes. So, yes, um, that was we, – we'd actually used a, a couple different artists uh, up to that point for a lot of the other covers, and they did fine. Um but this one, it just nobody could capture the plant. Yeah, they weren't quite hitting the mark on things. No, and it, it was the plant, and, and you know, everybody was like, "Oh, we could do something else." I'm like, "No, I want the plant. I need somebody and anybody who could do the plant." Actually, um, I couldn't hit the mark the first few times, from what I remember. Um, let me see. Uh, essentially, we had to find somebody of greater skill uh, than our uh, usual one. Oh, real quick while he's looking that up, uh, from the comments, uh, <laughs> we have uh, Kate who says, which character is most like you? The one talking to the plant. Amen to that. Uh, I often base uh, characters in my books off of people in real life. And in this case, I absolutely based uh, the, the craziest people, usually off of myself. Also, most of the villains, but not the point. Uh, and then Mike says it's unanimous. Will's picture looks like a mugshot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's that. That that was my fault. I put together the thumbnail for this. <laughs> <laughs> and, you did this to yourself. <laughs> and, I, and, and right now, and my brother was getting after me about a week ago about my trying to find a photo of me, a more recent photo, and there aren't many out there right now. I've been kind of aloof when it comes to having people take my picture because it pictures end up online. And so I've been, I've been avoiding that a little bit, and but I do need to get some better pictures. So. And the pandemic, it, it's not like you go out places where people are taking pictures either. It's not yeah, like, Oh, and here's exactly. where I, you know, at the church picnic or whatever. Like, no, there, there was none. Yeah. Uh, and so. so even those, those candid camera moments are just gone now. So, so if we do this again, I promise to get a better picture. <laughs> yes. it's, uh, it, it's pretty hilarious. Though, you'll actually. notice he, he's a smiley guy. <laughs> he, he doesn't look like that. Well, and the thumbnail was worse before because my name was like centered under my chin. So it looked like this. <laughs> and I'm like, ah, I got to fix this. I got to push. Now it we just need some numbers. <laughs> and I'm like, I was just too lazy to go find a better picture, I guess. Hey, Jake, can you, can you bring up my monitor? Is that, is that working right now? All right, so we're going to look at some earlier drafts of the Price of Survival cover art. Uh, and to be clear, I told him that I wanted a plant and a pot that was in trouble. Yeah. Okay? However you show peril of, yeah. of a plant, and also that it was a banana plant, kind of a broadleaf, almost tropical type, but again, ha having some issues. Yeah. Um, so when I, I think when I first started on this, I didn't have the pot. Um, I didn't have that uh, that in the brief that was given to me. And so this first thumbnail is actually my favorite, but it did not communicate what you wanted at all. And I think that's when it cleared up. It's like, oh, we want this something with a pot breaking or whatever. And and anyways, I, I just wanted to show this because I realized I had them. And so and there's, yeah, there's that's a, way cool. I haven't seen these in years. Yeah, there's a process to this. And so it, it was it was a fun project to work on. I've always wanted to do more illustration. I've always leaned into the motion graphics and visual effects more than my illustration. So I, I'm, I'm about to have more questions on that. I just want to make sure that this gets finished first. But that does actually. 
which sounds yeah. fascinating. And and so this is um, this was a, a kind of a first step for me with kind of a direction I would like to go later on. But yeah, I know you don't. A little bit later, we can talk about that. But nice. Were anyways. were we able to get these these images up, Jake? They're up. They're up. Oh, excellent, they're up. excellent. Yeah, so. Um, so yeah, I said these were some of the earlier ones. Uh, I, I love that you found the perfect Dawes. That that's the eyes in the background. That's Colonel Dawes. Yeah. Just somebody dark and relentless, right? Just a bit this guy. And... Yeah, this guy <laughs> will kill you uh, if he thinks it's right. And can do you have it on here? The uh, the finished project. Yes, I do. So I even oh. have, I even have some close ups. So boom. Yep. There's the finished one there. Oh yes. So. Yes, that was perfect. And. I believe you wanted the kind of the flashes of light, like almost like it's going to explode because it's a war confession. I haven't read the book. <laughs> so, I do need to read the book. I've read parts of it. You gave me a few parts as a, a way of, of creating a foundation for the piece. And right. Everything. That's not unusual, by the way. For the I, I know. I know. Uh, my, my feelings are not hurt. People okay. tend to have their focuses and I realize that. You know, if you spend all your time on art, you probably aren't spending all your time on books like I yeah, do. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, so no, I appreciate your specialty and the skill it created. And and to uh, show for you for a bit, I've heard nothing but good things about this book. So oh, I, oh, I absolutely. need to sit down and read it. So. Absolutely. Uh, but, you know, I, I did want to show more of an imminent danger to the plant, which, again, was something other artists just couldn't quite even wrap their minds around, yeah. like, what, what is he, is what he is running that? from a bus or something? Like, well, what are you even talking about? Yeah. But yeah, you managed to show this this very elemental. And that's kind of what the Tannics are. Those are kind of the the, the bad guys mm -hmm. in the Priceless Rilo. It's a very raw, elemental kind of destructive magic. And I, I think you captured it Sweet. perfectly. Awesome. Um, so you mentioned this was your first book cover. Yeah. All right. Pretty sure. So tell yeah. me more about what other stuff you have done. What what. What were you doing before that, or what are some pieces you're especially proud of? Let's so I, I'm I'm show off. <laughs> when people ask me like, what do you do? I always start with motion graphics and visual effects, and and so and a lot of people are like, oh, for movies, and I'm like, yeah, sometimes, but it's it's not quite as exciting as that. Sometimes it is, but not all the time. Now, I'll stop you. Just because it's not exciting for you doesn't mean it's not That's exciting true. for us. That's true. It's true. <laughs> right? Anyone's job is exciting if you only have to talk about it for you know five minutes yeah, yeah. Uh, it's when you get into the, all the minutiae that it gets boring so no i believe me i'm still incredibly interested to hear about what motion graphics are yeah so uh with motion graphics and visual effects i've been doing that ever since i was very little actually so i, okay. I come from a big family kind of like you uh, how how uh, all right there's already a lot to unpack there how little are we talking i'm talking we like three-year-old will like claymation animating or something um, like actually yes uh, and i'm glad you said that because i wouldn't have thought about that so most kids back in the late 80s early 90s were starting to get vhs or vhs recorders in the house and so there was there was the a, big old shoulder mount camcorders yeah yeah those, those, those same ones they're great they're awesome i actually found the one i grew up with recently my brother found it at the di the same nice. one. got that want to do some stuff with that huh yeah, it's and it's in perfect shape. So I want to do something with it, just for nice. memory's sake, and then I'll probably get rid of it. But ah, uh, good old nostalgia. Uh, <laughs> yep. Uh. Um. Anyways, doing like Lego uh, stop motion animation and clay too. I I had an older brother that was doing using clay all the time, and so we did a lot of stuff with that too. But um, where I consider the start of my visual effects and motion graphics career was uh, <laughs> one of my older brothers, and I. I and you'll hear this a lot. I'm I'm a chimera of all my siblings. I, I do feel that way uh, because they have all these interests and that's all been distilled slowly down to the youngest. Right. And now, so, now, once again, you say you're in a big family. This this is key to understanding a person. What number are you of how many? I am number seven of eight. Seven of oh, eight. Oh, sorry, sorry. Six of eight. Six of eight. Yeah. Okay. All right, that that does paint a picture. Six of eight. So that's I, where I am in the board collective. So six of eight. So yes, I I am fourth of nine. <laughs> fourth of uh, nine. Which I'd also, like. So I'd again, like to make a correction. Will is seven of eight. Oh yeah, seven, seven of eight. Seven of eight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Will, Will, are you losing siblings? I, I, not uh. yet, thankfully. <laughs> Hopefully not soon. <laughs> no, seven of eight. So, yeah, that's right. That's right. You think I have imaginary friends. Will is already adding in <laughs> extra siblings between him and the end. 
Uh, um, but yeah, I'm so I'm the youngest boy, and and most of our family's boys. We have two sisters at each end, um, but all of them I consider inspirations uh, and make up a huge part of who I am and where I've gone in my career with with my talents and my skills. And so, so my oldest brother he got into 3D animation uh, in the mid '90s, late '90s. He had a copy of a piece of software called 3D Studio Max, and I can remember the first time I ever sat down with that, and and that probably had the biggest impact on my life up to this point is is that one moment so and i've been in 3d involved with 3d ever since and and i had another brother i kind of i stepped away from it and he reintroduced it to me when i could actually do something with it i had the mental capacity to do something with it and that's where i'm Say, that's where it took can off, you so. remember your first project like what is the you know for oh. programmers it's hello world right the first time they they create that hello world on the screen for you know motion yeah. graphics what is your hello world is it a waving hand a walking guy what what's the so what's the moment the one that sticks out in my mind there was a lot before this but the one that feels like i was taking it seriously like i had i had a passion for this and i wanted it done i wanted it to look good was uh in high school it was actually my senior year in high school where i did a little short film for the utah multimedia festival which I think is still a thing. It might be called something else nowadays, but um, I don't know. Anyways, it's called, I was reading books. <laughs> it's called Bandwagons. I I I do not. I don't even know if I still have a copy of it. To tell you the truth, I kind of wish I did. I, it's probably somewhere, but I gotta look for what, it. What's the name? The internet will find it it's, for us. It's, I'm confident. It's called Bandwagon, and it's these Bandwagon. it's these characters. It's it's a, a typical teenager following the crowd, kind of rebelling against following the crowd. It has this guy on a couch. And he slowly take the scene changes. There's three different scenes, and he slowly loses limbs as it goes along. And other people see him as he loses his arms, and then the scene changes, and so they lose their arms. But now he's missing his legs, and basically he turns into a lump on the couch. And in the very last scene, the two guys that are also there following his path are like, eh, "We're not going to go that far." And that's, <laughs> and that's how it was. Um, anyways, that's that's that would I would consider that my my debut. In, in in the 3D realm in general, which really got my start into that. So nice. So there was some education and stuff before, like school projects. But that's that was w this is all will. So anyways. nice. Yep. Yeah. So that was the 3D end of it. The illustration end of it, I've been doing as long as I can remember too. I like that in your first project, you had this like social commentary <laughs> yeah, about no. conformity anybody who knows me i'm, I'm very much into uh the cerebral in stories i like to I, really I think it. about stories and and dig into it probably way more than you probably should um <laughs> but, and you'll probably see that when we talk a little bit about the retro gaming a little bit more but i, I do i love digging into into politics and philosophy and and thinking about how that applies to me and to my art as well so nice yeah. I, I put most of my politics on uh, imaginary worlds. Uh, <laughs> keep keep a little distance between me and reality. Yeah, uh, that that helps for me. Well, and bandwagon was definitely on the nose. It had all the finesse of a, a, a senior high school student that couldn't focus <laughs> on anything. So, it, <laughs> meaning it wasn't much. But now, now, did you have a lot of that that peer pressure? Did you feel that desire to conform? You know, that's a good question. I I. Thinking back on high school and my group of friends, I felt like I was kind of in the run of the mill group of friends. There wasn't too too much special there. I wasn't like with the jocks or the ultra nerds. It was just kind of floating in between groups. I was in drama, but I was in art, but I was in the computer classes too. And I talked to popular kids every once in a while. I was an SBO, a student body officer in my senior year. So I was talking to faculty and other kids that were involved with that quite a bit. So I was kind of a little bit everywhere. Um, I did like my alone time though. I love playing video games. And so I wasted way too much time when I was younger playing <laughs> video games. Um, but yeah, that's. So, so you didn't really have a, uh, exclusive enough peer group to maybe feel that, that peer pressure you're saying. Yeah, no. And it, I think, I really think it was just teenage angst that <laughs> nice. it, was, it was, what can I comment on hey, that, that I can relate that to? That fueled and a so, lot of art. <laughs> so, right? Yeah. <laughs> So that's uh, that's what it turned into, and it was it was a competition piece too. So I was hoping it'd stick out. Turns out nobody else entered anything into the competition, so got first place. But I, oh, good, good. Oh, so that's that was... an that's an interesting story. 
let's talk about that and and will and this is a frustration and 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 if i get a little too negative here tell me um but in in junior here, here we'll start out yeah. with a joke then or not a joke <laughs> i think i actually had an uncle uh who entered a rodeo might have been a cousin yeah immediate family member who entered a rodeo was the only one who entered and still got third uh so really I- i'm assuming the gave first to the bull uh, <laughs> so when you said you were the only one who entered, I actually remembered that and was already like, so d- did you win? <laughs> I- I'm I'm glad you won. Yeah, Anyways. yeah. I got first place, but that's because nobody else entered into 3D. And it was a pretty new thing for the high school level, um, the 3D animation stuff. And and so that's probably why. And and so I don't really consider it a win. I, I consider it a personal win that I that I got something finished and entered it and people saw it. Nice. So. That's, okay. that's how I look at it. All right. We're ready now, Will. Okay. Go deep. So something that's frustrated me, and this could be where I was born and raised, but I didn't take hardly any art classes in junior high and high school because the first art classes I took in junior high, I entered into the art show, and I took it very seriously. I wanted to do the best I could. Turns out nobody else, as far as I n- knew, my my perspective, nobody else took it seriously. And so guess who got all the ribbons? Will got all the ribbons. Heck yeah. And, and after that, I'm like, I'm not going to do art shows anymore because if there's no competition, what's the point? And and so... Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm tired of beating all these morons. Well, no, it isn't, it isn't that, though. <laughs> it's like, what's the point of doing it if nobody's competing? And, and it's like you walk out onto the football field and you're the only one there, right? There's, it's no fun. Anyways, this happened a couple more times. So in high school, I, I went for Sterling Scholar. And there was one other kid that entered in for artist, but he didn't have the credentials at all to, mm. to qualify to even run. And so it was, Will's the default again. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and, and I, I, I got to state with that. The best, best part of that experience was uh, I got to meet uh, Greg Olson. I don't know if you know Greg Olson. He's an LDS artist. Oh, yeah. Um, I, did, I had no idea it was him until after I walked out of the room, out of the interview, and there, and there uh, one of my classmates, she's like, you know who that is? No, it's Greg Olson. I'm like, holy crap, I'm glad I didn't know that. <laughs> anyways, it, it, it was good. But anyways, same thing happened with Sterling Scholar, and, and I, was, I was really frustrated with that, and, and I got to college. And uh, we can hop back to the 3D stuff here if we want to. But I got to college and I was so bored in college um, that I, I was doing projects outside of class. And I was in a 2D animation class with the dean of the multimedia department. I was showing him my stuff and he's like, Will, go get a job because you're already doing stuff that the senior portfolio students are, are working on. And You don't belong and, here, boy. And that one's a little bit different. <laughs> the high schools had started a 3D animation program, so the colleges were way behind. And so, oh. and so I've always been kind of disenchanted with uh, formal education because it, it felt like, I don't want to say they couldn't keep up with me, but that's what it looks like from the outside. But it, it was call it like it is. So, man. Yeah, and 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 so I've I've always been self motivated, and I think those experiences are why I'm self motivated because I feel like those institutions aren't really ready to 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 support me, and so it haven't been it haven't been anyways. So okay, anyways, okay. So that was a lot to <laughs> yeah, no, no, covered a lot of chronological no, this... ground <laughs> there. So. Uh... But, uh, oh, uh, Kate asked, are comments? all of Will's siblings accounted for? Are you sure that you, uh, you know where, where you sit and all that? Yeah, I think so. Oh, okay. All right. I think mom and dad have mentioned an evil twin a few times, but I, I'm not ah. sure. We thought we might, may have spot him a few weeks ago. We were watching a YouTube channel and you're like, well, that's your British. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We found British Will. <laughs> it, it was really awesome. So I joked it. It's probably my evil twin. <laughs> oh, there, there you go. There you go. Uh, all right so fast forward can we see a couple things that you are like really proud of do you have like some um, let's some show pieces for us possibly? let's let's look at my i recently put together a demo reel um and it covers quite a bit of ground actually I love demo reels. about the last 10 years um <laughs> and of, a real quick of my life so for the camera, what is a demo reel? Yeah, so a demo reel, you'll you'll hear that a lot in the video world. And basically, you take pieces of productions that you worked on, specific parts, and you compile it to a song so you can quickly show off what you can do. 
skill wise. Right. So that's a demo reel. Okay, Will. Let's see. Let's see what you can do. And we can pause this as we go along if you if you're interested in anything specific. Or... Okay. I think I'd rather just make little comments as it goes. So every just about everything you see in here except for live action stuff is is my work. Um, there's a few exceptions to that where uh, people did some green screening and, and things like that, but. Now, is this like vast amounts of math or is this, <laughs> you know, cause I, I see some of these things like, like with the ocean, all the things and, and I see algorithms and uh, you know, fractals and things like that. Or is this art like, are, are you, it's, it's a little bit of both depending on what needs to get done. Um, so this is actually a really good example right here. You see the door fly off there? It's a real shot. Let's see if we can get back to it. I'll play it one more time. Right, boom, there goes the door. So the smoke and the door, that was all fake in that shot. And But the camera is moving, right? And so you have to do what's called a 3D camera track. And I don't want to dive into it too much. It can get really, really boring. But there's a lot of math <laughs> that happens there automatically, typically. If for whatever reason the program can't figure it out, Will has to figure it out. Uh -huh. I have to figure out how high the camera is off the ground. I have to figure out what angle it's pointing out, how far away things are in the scene, if nobody took measurements, because nobody takes measurements typically. And, and so there can be some math involved in figuring that out. Hopefully there isn't, so I can do more of the art side. And so the uh, artistic right. side, making it look right and the flash when the door comes off and stuff like that. I'm interested, nice. I'm kind of, I'm interested in both sides, but I'm more interested in the, in the artistic side for sure. That's all 3D right there. <clears throat> so this, what you're seeing right here was a project I worked in on at the beginning of last year. And it was 52 shots all on green screen, 52, 53, somewhere around there. Wow. And that, that's the biggest VFX job I've done to date. Um, and we can go back and talk about that a little bit more. But this is my bread and butter. Um, this is what I would call motion graphics, where I'm designing um, the characters, I'm designing the color palettes and the camera movements and compiling those to a script, to a story, a narrative for a company or a product. So here's another example. Um, another thing a motion graphics designer does is design motion, obviously. Right, <laughs> and right. so how things move is, is super important to make sure it's interesting. Because, uh, and, and here's a good example, like PowerPoint pre presentations. I don't know if you remember the first time you saw one. It was probably pretty cool. Right. But decades go by literally decades <laughs> at this point and they're probably the most boring things in the world and it's almost like a kind of a joke now that if somebody uses a powerpoint at a meeting it's like oh another powerpoint <laughs> I know we'd rather see people again and so that's motion graphics artists that's what they fight they fight uh that boring part of graphics moving things that aren't people moving around on the screen you have nice. to make those interesting so stuff man i have more questions about that generator it's a cool generator we can talk about that for a bit if you want oh, I, I i don't think i, I can do it justice but i can give a i think a little introduction to it a lot of product things yeah gotta pay the bills am i right yeah That's it. Nice. So is there is there anything you want to see specific before I jump into something? I was going to just go to the the frozen stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, go ahead. Go let's, ahead. Let's start there. See if I can find. So, and I already talked about the 3D camera track, so I'm going to skip past this too. So I did I did actually I so there's a YouTube channel and I'm going to call them out here because they're pretty awesome. They're not sponsoring us or anything, but uh, they're called Working with Lemons and they're a local Utah family that does real life Disney. 
and uh, they just take nice. Disney songs and do them in real life. And, working and with so, lemons. Nice. Yeah, working with lemons. <laughs> <laughs> They're working with lemons. Um, and they they uh, they create some awesome content, and it's been it's been awesome being able to work with them. Um, now, to be clear, so on this on this scene, that lady is looking at nothing. So, and that's what I was going to bring up. This song, there's two different songs I worked on. This, There's actually three, sorry. But this song was actually shot at a castle up in Provo. And so the only oh, thing nice. added is this, the sparkles and this thing flying around. Same thing with this shot. Um, but, sorry, th this was a little bit confusing. Let me jump to... So these shots right here. These were all 100% on green screen. So she was on solid green. And I had to cut her out and uh, figure out where the camera was sitting in a, in a virtual space. So I had to recreate how high the camera was off the ground, the focal length. I had to get match that so it looks right. And and then I had to recreate things like the reflection in the floor. And, and So and she's just like walking around a, what, a green room? A green room with and bright just... lights looking amazed at things yeah no it's it's, it's great get going out there and trying to give direction to that they're like there's going to be this horse flying around you and, and granted this was a little bit easier because we had a reference right the movie had come out and and so they right. got a reference so she could she knew how to emote according to how elsa emoted but there were some changes we had to make too because we couldn't do everything that was in the movie so but yeah right. it's like it's all green but imagine there's these cool <gasps> crystals in front of you with this Ooh. magical horse riding around you and uh, anyways, oh, this may have. Now, real quick, before we get too far away from the uh, the whole PowerPoint thing, we do have a, a question in the chat. How do you feel about animations in PowerPoints? I don't know. It's questionable. I think PowerPoint should just go away. And, and, we've outgrown and, PowerPoints as a as a and, and as I, a society. No, I'm just biased. <laughs> I want you to pay me to do your PowerPoint, so it looks awesome. <laughs> That there we go. There we go. <laughs> so, no uh, animations and powerpoints. I, I I actually don't have a whole lot of experience with powerpoints being used in meetings. To to be completely honest, I, my my experience with powerpoints is putting a few together myself and and trying to use them. And they, and they're useful tools. But uh, I think you can easily convey the large amounts of information. You can distill that down into a video that's a few minutes long and and be a lot more interesting. All right, so. I have to ask this question. All right. Let's say there's some random, you know, forget high school. We're going to go middle schooler. Okay. We're talking an eighth grade English assignment, right? <laughs> Just a report on the hatchet by Gary Polson. Oh, I love that book. And we want you to make their book report presentation just ridiculous. Right, just the most overproduced thing. How long is a book report like that? <laughs> Most kids are like what a minute, okay. two minutes. Like they get yeah. up and like you know, uh, <laughs> Brian crashes and has to eat berries and they make him sick and then a moose almost kills him. I think I don't know. I just read the cliff notes anyway. Uh, but you know, let's say we just wanted to straight up prank an English teacher <laughs> with an awesome motion with, with an awesome motion graphics presentation. <laughs> What first of all, what would that take, and then what would that cost? What would that prank cost just to blow some middle school English teacher's mind? So, if we're looking at about a minute, uh, a minute long video, it'd take about two weeks worth of time. Um, wow! To get it done, and uh, what I would do is I'd charge somewhere between a thousand and two thousand dollars, depending on what need, what the script ends up being for that. Oh, man. So, I still want to do it though. Yeah. <laughs> it'd be really cool it would be well and you're so traveling cool. around to schools it'd be awesome to pick out a kid who's like i'm gonna invest in you and, and oh we're gonna man do the most awesome book report ever just oh, tell man. your friends well, to make I, sure I've they're had, live streaming i've had kids reach out to me on like instagram and stuff and say like i'm gonna do a book report on your book for english class i'm like cool like right <laughs> people are yeah people are doing book reports on my books but man That's just awesome. to to drop some fully ridiculous you know have the the kid walking through the the sea of <laughs> twirling stars and fireworks as he explains and 
well, it'd be cool to even have just like he's if he's walking through the book, right? <laughs> and have like not necessarily cardboard cutouts, but like dioramas of certain scenes pop up around him, and he actually talks about at this point. Ooh, like where the so. page, like the book opens and the scene like springs yeah. up out of the page. Yeah. Love that. Kind of kind of like a pop up, but a all lot, day lot cooler looking. So no, that'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if either of us gets excessively rich at some point, I think we need to drop a couple thousand. <laughs> Uh, on to a, blow away a teacher. <laughs> yes. Yes. We, we target the teacher. We use a student and just have it be ridiculous. Create an awesome video. It'd be I awesome. love it. Anyways. I love it. I'm, I'm really proud of this particular piece recently because I had somebody from Disney Animation who was actually one of the directors for Ooh. the shots in the movies reach out and said, and said, I had to reach out because you did an incredible job with this. Good job. Nice. So I'm, I'm super proud of that. And I am bragging because. Oh, heck yeah, man. Get after it. Because I've always had this chip on my shoulder with like organization and institutions and stuff like that. And having somebody from the beast, from the machine, reach out and say, <laughs> as a generalist, a generalist is just somebody who does a little bit of everything in the visual effects. You did an incredible job. So that, that was, it was a huge thing for me. Um, so anyways. Nice. Nice. Yeah. No, I, I love it, man. <laughs> and yeah, don't worry about bragging. We, we use yeah. very little humility in this show. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. Well, well, dang. Um, now I do have to ask relative to like your, your life's dream. Where is this? Like, are you, is, are you already living the dream? Are you heading towards something or? Yeah. Every year, I think I know what the dream is, and every year I realize I don't. So, so you're still finding it. I'm still finding it. Okay. No, so, I, I get that. Um, I, I feel, I feel like this is a tool that will help me, um, achieve whatever that is. And, and at the same time, I don't know if that's even achievable. Uh, I see. This is, this is me getting into kind of the more cerebral part of what what is what is what the dream? does it all mean <laughs> what does it all mean and i don't want to get cheesy with that but but at the same time especially this last year because um so i've been doing freelance for about five years and or sorry about ten, well i ran a company with my brothers but i've been doing freelance as well and um i've i've that dried up with covid a lot of that money and so i'm like oh i gotta go get a nine to five i've never had a nine to five job ever and not so, once, huh? Not once. And so I kind of got one <laughs> the last like six months. It was a nine to five. Like I put myself on a schedule. I stuck to that. And I found myself um, not liking it. So I wasn't necessarily unhappy, but but I was doing what I was, what I've been doing, but I just, it just didn't feel right. And so right now I feel like I need to redirect myself uh, into, into something else. And I'm, and I'm figuring that out right now. So yeah. Uh, real quick, I, I do want to take a moment because it looks like we've had some new people join us. And uh, the question is, what are you guys talking about? Uh, <laughs> we are actually getting to know a person, right? This this whole thing, the Storyteller Teacher is all about stories and stories come from people. Uh, so we are getting to know this person. Uh, this is William Thorpe. He, he is an artist. Uh, that is how he makes his living is through his art. Uh, right, I make my living through my words, uh, my videos, and my books. And so this is someone uh, I've actually always been really fascinated by artists because I am so incredibly deficient in that particular area. So visual art, specifically. Oh, vi visual yeah. art. It is. It's real bad, Will. Because I can. It's real I bad. consider you an artist, by uh, the way. <laughs> oh yeah, but, but words yeah. are my yeah, art, right? Yeah, that words. is my paintbrush. Yeah. Is is the spoken and yeah. written word that I can. I can weave those like a tapestry. I love them. Yeah. <laughs> um, but ask me to draw a stick figure on a piece of paper, and there's going to be some hands sticking out of the face or something. It, it, like my hands do not obey me. Best uh, stick figures ever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I see all this, and it looks like magic. Uh, the closest I can come to relating, you know, so I kind of like grabbed onto that idea of like there being math involved. Because math, I get. Yeah. I can do math. But, Thankfully, like, most of it's in the background now for for us artists. <laughs> yeah, see, so, I, I'd be happier doing the math. <laughs> with the 3D, you get a little bit closer to the math because there's things with like cameras and stuff that you have to set up. But but most of it has been it's opaque now. So yeah. thankfully. Anyway, so yes, those who are just joining us, we are talking to Will, the artist. He actually did the uh, the cover art for one of my novels, uh, and where there has been uh, some of the animations and graphics and some of these things. 
uh, Will was also behind some of that. So he's actually been uh, behind the scenes for, for a lot of stuff. Yeah, for almost five years now. I've been doing little things probably. How long have you been since Thor Media? Uh, well, let's see. I, I've been published for about six and a half, seven years, but we didn't get, I didn't uh, cross paths with Thor Media until. Audiobook. Right, that's right. So was. I was two or three books yeah. in. So we, we were a couple of years in that. So I'd say about five years. Yeah, so it's been about five yeah, years. That, that sounds about right. And it's been on and off. Like, it hasn't been a consistent, like, calling right. you up on the weekends, like, now. going out for some drinks, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> eh, it's been a good friendship. <laughs> yeah. But the only problem is, is the the timeline is boring. We, we need to talk about something else or we're going to lose half our viewers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so. About 14 right now. 14 minutes. Oh, 14 viewers. 14 viewers. 14 people. Man, we're, we're getting bigger and bigger every time. Uh, tell your friends. Tell your friends. <laughs> uh, and again, just to tell everybody, uh, this is what we're going to do on the first Thursday of every month. So every Thursday, yeah. there's going to be a live stream. Uh, first Thursday, we're going to have somebody else in the chair, right? Today was Will. Next month, it'll be somebody else. And we're just kind of going to do like a slice of life and again, get these stories. And first of all, I know we aren't even near the end yet, but... Will, thank you for coming. This was already awesome. Yeah. I, I've enjoyed Glad the, the stories. Um, and we have a, a whole nother part of your life. Yes. We we haven't even gotten into, and I meant and, to and maybe in. this And maybe this is the dream. Maybe this is the segue into okay. the dream. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't that, know That's yet. true. We, we were talking about, because when I say the dream, it would it is what would you do if you could do anything? anything yeah right like for me it would either be just actually writing full-time okay i love writing books i would do that full-time even if i didn't need the money um or riding horses uh that's you know until i was about 14 years old i want to be a cowboy man uh you know it was not the dream from the beginning to be a to be an author you I can ride a horse a cowboy right? oh heck yeah okay good, good. yep Got that, that part done. That, that'd be even funnier. No, I, I, I have the skill. Now I just need a horse and a field. Uh, and I, I'd be set. Uh, oh, yeah, and somebody to pay the bills, right? That, that's bill. also missing. Um, so, yeah, it, I feel like the, the dream is what could you do if you could do anything? And you mentioned that you're already kind of exploring that or always uh, exploring that. But we have another bit of, uh, what would you call it, nostalgia as a hobby? Nostalgia is a uh, sickness, bro. <laughs> nostalgia is a sickness. I love it. I uh, so uh, kind of going back to the timeline a little bit. Um, th that I'm a chim I I'm a chimera of the rest of my family. Right. And you you, you drew on all their powers. Yeah. And some people would look at that and probably think they'd be a little ashamed of that. I'm not. And and Oops. I and oh, part own it. And part of that chimera is a is Atari. It's video games, but specifically Atari. Um and I kind of have to get a, give a brief story of Atari, and I'm going to make this super brief because we don't have a lot of time. Atari is the grandfather of video games. Everybody knows that. What they don't know is they floundered, fell on their face multiple times at the end before they were sold off in 1996. They did. They really let their fans down. And so there's one console in particular, and some of you may may recognize it. Most of you probably don't, actually. But But back here is the Atari Jaguar. Jaguar, Jaguar. I'm gonna, Jaguar. I'm gonna say it like an American, <laughs> Jaguar. Um, anyways, uh, people make fun of me. Uh, so, yeah, I can get into so much. I, British I people, I Brit too. British people make fun of me because I do live streams with this Jaguar stuff every once in a while, and they're like, "It's not Jaguar, it's Jaguar," because of the car or something like that. And it's like, well, let's the just cat schedule doesn't, that in. Shall the we? cat doesn't even live in your country. Like, <laughs> so, anyway, how, how do you have? <laughs> So, so Atari released this last console before they went bankrupt in 1996. So th this was the, the, the end of, I guess, you, you know, people always talk about the beginning of the end. This was the end of the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So Atari builds this empire on video games, video games. and wonder. Yeah. And you know, uh, and there's a neat story with that too. Uh, the founder of Atari, Nolan Bushnell, he grew up here in Utah. A lot what? of people don't what? know this. And he got the idea for video games from working at the arcade at Lagoon. Whoa! He realized that he could take, he saw something, and I can't remember this detail of the story. Maybe somebody in the chat can fill this in. But um, 
he he saw video games up at the college or somewhere he saw a game called space wars and he's like how can i make money off this and he happened to be working in an arcade where it was pinball machines and other you know analog arcades and he realized wait a second nice. if i can take that game that video game which i don't even think was called that at that point yeah arcade game yeah or something. it was called just a program or something probably because it was on big college computers and stuff how can i make that small make an arcade anyways Video games were born here in Utah, and okay. a lot of people don't realize that. Uh, to be clear, uh, for those who are joining us from around the country or the world or whatever, at this moment where we are sitting is less than 15 miles from Lagoon. Yeah. Uh, the, the place in the story, it's a, a, a an amusement park. Yeah, you walk in, and it's at the first juncture. You turn left, and the arcade's right there. So that was the, oh. the beginning of Atari... Yeah, it was uh, it was the beginning of the video game industry, not video games in general, but video the video game industry because he figured out how to take video games and make money off of it. So, money. which some people might say, oh, he's 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 making money off of something that should be free, but at the same time, we wouldn't have all the great games if you're into video games. You, we wouldn't have all these great games without that. Oh so, yeah, oh yeah. So. There's something. Sorry, that isn't Magical a personal about story, money. but I, I thought I'd no, point no, that I, out. No, no, I loved it's, it. It's I had no neat. idea. Yeah. I learned. <laughs> See, this, this is exactly why we are having this segment, so I can draw new stories. I'm, I'm like, feeding on this. So back to the Jaguar. That's kind of That story kind of sets up the mystique around oh, this console specifically. Jaguar, actually? Jaguar. Jaguar <laughs> is probably how we should say it. But. Uh, anyway. Hmm. Anyways, so... So we have this massive company. They were making tons of money in the 70s. They crashed the market in the 80s. They tried to recover in the late 80s, early 90s, and they just, they bombed. And made some cool games. No, they made some I, I awesome I grew up games. with an Atari ST. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so this is another commonality. We yes. Have. It, yes. I, I have nostalgia in no. this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, man, what was it? W- was it your family's first personal computer? Do you know? Yes. Pretty sure it didn't have a Commodore 64 or something. No, nope, never that. had a Commodore 64. I do believe uh-huh. the Atari ST was the first. My dad actually had some spreadsheet software on it, uh, which we tried to figure out how to play a game with that. I mean, we were just little kids, so we probably messed up everything <laughs> he ever <laughs> tried ever to do. do. <laughs> and ultimately, it ended up just a kid's game computer because, yeah, I, I think we just destroyed it too many times over. And th- And that's the computer I learned on as well was the atari st oh and nice so before we got pcs well it might have been at the same time but that was the one i gravitated to um because it was easy to plug in easy to start up and easy to start playing games and so yeah. grew up with siblings playing games on that um, king's quest 2 uh, king's quest <laughs> oh man okay come we, on there's got to be people at home who played king's quest 2 shout yeah. out they they must exist i know we won't win this but we should do a quick poll in the chat Space Quest or King's Quest? Oh, psh. because we were we were a Space <laughs> Quest family. We didn't do King's Quest. <laughs> I, I did play both, but man, there was just nothing to compare to that <laughs> that guy in the little hat. Maybe, maybe that's where I got the whole idea of like the hero in the hat trope yeah. thing I got going. <laughs> was King's Quest? All I need is a feather, man. I'm trying to remember his name. He's, you remember his name, Jake? You played those. I, oh, I do come not. On. You did not. That's okay. Somebody in the chat. Roger Wilco is. Roger space Wilco is the Space Quest guy, the space janitor. If Julie is watching, she can. Oh chime man, in and I can almost. Know. Know. Oh, Bryce uh, and the chat says Secret of Monkey Island for the win. Uh, no. <laughs> no, no, Space no, Quest or King oh, Quest? Yes. That's not even Sierra. Come on, Graham. Yes, <laughs> Graham. Bryce. Thank you, King Graham. King, oh man, Prince Graham, then King Graham. I think he turns into King at the end of the first game, or something like that. Yeah, so. in the in the second one, he decides he needs a lady. Uh, and so he, they're, they're oh, that's this, right. This motion graphics, yep. which were just spectacular. Yo, those were huge at the time of, too. Of him taking off his crown, which had like you know, it was made of maybe ten yellow blocks. I think was the, the graphics <laughs> at that point, and putting on his adventure hat and walking off to go and find him a lady. That's cool. and <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> That that was that was awesome, and thank you, Bryce King Grant. That that already takes me back. See, this this is the nostalgia is a sickness, right? We, yeah. We've already rediscovered it here. Uh, anyways, so so uh, Atari <laughs> comes out with the the Jag computer. Yeah, and so, uh, and it failed miserably. 
Like, <laughs> absolutely. I think they made something like 300,000 consoles. Who knows how many of those were tossed into a landfill? Oh, and, no. and, and so it's this, but there's some, so it has this mystique that one of the greatest video game companies in the world had this, it's, it's a good console but nobody made games for it and it, and it flopped oh. on its face. And so there's this mystique of there's potential here that this, this, this was untapped. Nobody really exactly. got and whether that's true this or not, console and whether that's true or not, it feels that way. And that's more important than if it's actually, especially in the undiscovered community. territory. Exactly. And there's kind of a joke in the community. It's like, because they in their marketing they push bits. Back then it was all about bits. Sixteen bits, oh, thirty-two oh, heck bits, yeah. sixty-four. Heck and, yeah. And so their commercials were do the math, sixty-four bits and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And so they and so there's this joke that it's like Jaguar power. There's this power, this untapped power in this console. <laughs> and and so and, and, and programmers, they the guys who actually make games for it still, they they joke about this all the time because inevitably on the forums you get these people like what could the jag really do newcomers you know and and you get these old timers that come in there and just burn the forest down (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah, and just go complete cynical and ironic with them and it's wonderful it's it's really good and now now you said something in there okay atari is dead and gone but you said People who are still making games for it. So, so this pe- is people are still making games for the, the they, Jag. They are, and so and anybody familiar with video games knows that there's kind of this retro resurgence with video games right now. And so you have games coming out on a lot of consoles. What makes the Jaguar unique is that you can legally make games on it. So Atari oh. and its assets were sold off to Bandai. And in 1998, there were still a handful of companies that had games in the works, but they couldn't legally release them because they had to be licensed through Atari. Ah. And so Bandai's like, we don't want to be bugged with this. And so they wrote a letter, and you can look this up. There's a letter that says, we are we are putting these things into the public domain. And I can't list off those specifically. I don't know them specifically. Nice. But, but things like the console itself, so people wouldn't have to uh, license it. And so you have this mystique of untapped potential and then you have a console that you're completely free to do whatever you want with open it up i like it and in the last five years five to six five to ten years specifically there has been a hard push into the jaguar development universe and the collecting (laughs) universe and it's it's frustrating because like certain parts of this console are nearing the thousands of dollars. So to even get one, <laughs> it's ridiculous. And it is, it's, the prices are ridiculous for this. What a lot of people at the time considered a piece of garbage. And, and, well, <laughs> anyway. but what I think of all the poor fools waiting in line for the PlayStation 5, <laughs> they don't even know <laughs> that this is good. <laughs> so they're missing out. <laughs> anyway, so just a long story short, I, 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 I grew up with Atari. We're kind of an Atari family in that regard. And I and most of my siblings have moved on. I haven't. I'm still growing up. I'm still very <laughs> infantile when it comes to that. And I I actually released a game back in 2016 called Flappy McFur. It's a Flappy Bird clone. And I designed nice. the box art and 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 all that. I I learned to solder for this so I could solder my own <laughs> microchips onto the cartridge. <laughs> On old stock that's sitting in bins in California somewhere. Oh my and, goodness! And I and I released it. We we sold it for like uh, forty five bucks a copy and sold a uh, hundred of them. So a hundred. Yeah. So there's about a hundred, two hundred people that actually buy this stuff. But. Wow. <laughs> Anyways, and I have uh, two more games in the works, and that's what I'm working on. But going back to the illustration side, your book cover kind of started a cascade, and so I've been able to do box art for other people's releases. This oh, one, so you did the art for this? Yeah, one. so I did the artwork. It's two sided actually, so it's, it has slightly different one for it's two games in one cartridge. And so, oh, yes, absolutely. I just want to make sure that people got this. This is Revenge of the Mutant Camel <laughs> and Lamatron. And what's special about these two games specifically? Besides the titles, so you mean? Bill Murray's kind of referred to as a secular saint. There's, okay. there's these kind of characters in the video game universe, too. So there's a man named uh, Jeff Minter, and he programmed these games originally for the ST. And these are ports to the Jaguar that somebody did recently. Oh. And, and so it, it's this is kind of a dream come true for me, to be associated with Jeff Minter in some way. And is so he, to do the artwork for his games was a Is was a he one deal. of your heroes, Will? Yeah. I wouldn't say a hero, but... Well, kind of. 
you, in, you in a lot of ways, to work or kind of that be way. associated with a great Jeff Minter. Yes, with the great Jeff Minter. So, nice. <laughs> anyways, so I, I love every part of this. So, so coming back to my dream, maybe this is this is my dream here. I don't know. This is so something that's been crossing my mind recently is learning to marry my motion graphics and my illustration with Atari somehow. Uh, more and more as time goes on. Um, wow. And video games in general is a storytelling device because I like stories too, and I would like to tell more stories within the video game universe. So, oh, anyways. I, we have a comment here in the chat that I simply cannot ignore. Uh, Kate said, Leonardo DiCaprio was supposed to play Bushnell in the film Atari, but the film never happened. What? Is this true? Is this true? I've never heard that before. And then... <laughs> Then she says he also founded Chuck E. Cheese. Yes, he he is, and I'm pretty sure he's still the owner of Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> he hasn't sold it off. So, um, he recently uh, he tried oh to start. I think it was in L.A. He was trying to start a restaurant, a new restaurant where it had the old tabletop arcades built in there, so you oh, could man. like an old style bar or whatever. Uh, anyways, he's this, he's still this doing has stuff. Been a roller coaster yeah, for me. It's cool. Uh, <laughs> we find out about the, the the rise from Utah of the Atari Empire, the crash, and then I guess the zombie that lives went off. went into uh, Chuck E. Cheese, and then the the people like William Thorpe and Jeff Minter who just yeah. carried it forward. Oh it's man. Fun stuff, that, that, that was fun. Okay, just one thing before we end, too. All right, yeah, do I it. I published a couple books. You can get these if you want them, but uh, just to see how far the sickness goes. <laughs> Every year, there's something called Inktober, and so I did 31 illustrations, Atari-related, published them in a book in one month. And so nice. they're, they're black and white illustrations, and anyways. so There you go. So, so anyone else, anyone out there who just really connected – uh, to this, I can let you know where you can get uh, the books. They're they're a little hidden, but you can find them for sale. There so, you go. So. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, anyone who just really connected with the nostalgia, I, I gotta admit, I'm gonna go home and find King's Quest too. I don't know oh. what uh, computer acrobatics I'm gonna have to pull to actually play it, but <laughs> dang it, I want to play that game again. So I I think I get it. Yeah, uh, it's a lot of fun. Oddly enough, I was left with no desire to go to a Chuck E. Cheese, but that was also cool. Uh, I still have my ST if you want to bust it out. And oh, play man. It for a bit. I'm more than willing to do it. We should do a live stream. Oh, man. <laughs> okay, that, that might happen right after the camera goes down that this might turn into an, an Atari ST party. Yeah. Uh, but we, we are pretty much about a, uh, out of time. Yeah. Um, but, yes, it, this... This was exactly what I wanted to happen. There were some cool stories, uh, not only about you, but about all this other stuff. I did not know that about Atari and the the rise, fall, and resurgence yeah. of Atari gaming. 3D all was, amazing 3D stuff. was born here in Utah as well, at University of Utah, just so you know. Everything so, before that was all 2D? Well, uh, computer graphics specifically yes. was born here. <laughs> so it's, it's weird how everything I do originated here without me even knowing most of that you know i, I say so. we just lean into the misquote and we all just claim that the third dimension was was created right here in utah, utah. let's let's say i, I say I'm we just <laughs> yep uh let's just shoehorn that into the state's wikipedia page uh, i think that <laughs> would be amazing i wouldn't be surprised if it was there we had the yeah. golden spike uh we, we invented the third dimension <laughs> right Oh, no, I already mocked it myself in my mind. I was like, yeah, it was with us. Uh, <laughs> anyways, so uh, that is it uh, for tonight. Uh, next week, same time, Thursday, 6.30 Mountain Standard Time, uh, we're going to be back with Story Stream. So Mike Forsyth will be here. Um, and we're going to be talking about the golden age of piracy, oh, yeah. right? So that's going to be uh, back to our historical stories for you Word of the Day fans. Uh, where We're going to dig deep into that, and it's it's going to be fun. Um, I hope it doesn't get too messy. I can tell you right now, Mike is way into this. Uh, he, he, is. he is going to... Uh, uh, it's uh, kind of his his thing, right? Th Pirates. Th this this is his like baby. That. Yeah. This is his baby, and uh, so hopefully, uh, we we won't have too many uh, stories of uh, I don't know 
I, I don't know, bloody horrible things that haunt my dreams. But uh, <laughs> it, it happens, right? There's all sorts of stories. Um, Can I shill really quick for myself? Oh, yeah. Get so after it. If, if you're interested in seeing some of my artwork or anything else, like my, I have a YouTube where I do time lapses of my paintings. I do a lot of digital artwork, and so I do time lapses of those. That sounds fascinating. Um, and I'm on Instagram. It's uh, just WilliamThorup.com. Link's in the description. So WilliamThorup.com. It's T-H-O-R-U-P. So. Okay. Is that on... Sorry, that sounds like a website, or is that the it, name it is a web... of the Instagram? No, that is that is the website. You can get to my Instagram and everything else through there. If, do, do you have an Instagram handle? Yes, I do. It's Thorup William. Thorup uh, William. Yeah, so altogether. WilliamThorup.com yeah, Thorup. or Thorup William on Instagram. There's another William Thorup in Utah. He got that, so I have to flip my name around for where he beats me to the punch. Basically. If the other <laughs> William Thorup is watching, we, we want that. He's, we want that name. You're my nemesis. <laughs> Maybe he was actually we should go go get some lunch or something that would that would be cool and then fight it out cool. all right uh so yes join us next week uh also if you like what we're doing here support us on patreon at this point we just kind of have what i call the tip jar uh just one dollar uh to support the channel and help us keep doing this because we're having a lot of fun and we hope you've enjoyed it too and thank you all and good See night you next time so that was a lot of fun